This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Party of One, D, 1, 4. Initiate, Part 2. So one of the things I know that we wanted to touch on, because it was a big inspiration for Anyone Can Wear the Mask, and because it is one of your favorite topics, <laughs> is yes. that we're, we're going to talk about Superman for a bit here. Uh, I, reluc- twist my arm. Ah, yeah. Twist my arm today. (laughs) Yes. I have forced Jeff into talking about Superman. (laughs) If I I must. Um, So for people that that don't know, if you have not been able to gather, um, I talked about this on the episode with Rich, but I'll talk about it uh, here again with you, Emily, because it's important to me to talk about Superman is I for as much as I was the Superman is boring teenager. Superman is like capital I important to me as an adult. It is a thing that I have thought so much about, like as a pop culture concept, it is not an understatement to say that Superman is pretty foundational into my moral compass of the world. That's probably not an overstatement, no matter what that says about me. Um, But like Superman is something that I think about constantly. It's a huge inspiration for anyone can wear the mask. And when we were discussing this episode, I was thinking about like a lens to talk about Superman that like wouldn't overlap with what I had talked about previously. And I found a thing. I found a topic that I want to I want to share with you, Emily, that connects back to Young Justice in like a really kind of cool and exciting way that kind of like segues really nicely into talking about teen superhero media yes that i'm way way excited to talk about so i want to talk about superman and his nemeses today like i want to talk about antagonistic design when it comes to superman because it's a topic that has been on my brain lately (laughs) i wonder why because i'm me like the (laughs) like like um, you could be you could say it's because i was writing a game about superman and his nemeses but honestly it was already there. Honestly, I was I were I able to drive to work, it would just be what I thought about <laughs> on the drive to work. Just y'all, I got hmm, Superman's antagonists are a really interesting reflection of what that character says about the world. Oh, I'm in a traffic jam. Okay, cool. Now I've got time to map things out. <laughs> <laughs> we we all like like you say this like it's some ridiculous thing. It's not. This welcome to Whelmed. Welcome <laughs> exactly. to what me and me and Rich and many of our guests do on a regular basis. Anytime is... someone tries to be like, I've thought too hard about this, I'm just like, I wrote a 70 page paper on Catwoman. <laughs> you can't you can't think too hard about it, guys. You can't do it. This is why I love this podcast and doing this podcast more than anything and why writing anyone can wear the mask and when i decided to really like promote it on things a non-zero percent part of that was because i wanted to come back on whelmed and (laughs) talk more about a thing so thank you i'm excited for this so here's what i want to talk about today yes antagonistic design as it relates to superman superman's antagonists are a fascinating look at what makes Superman as a character tick and what makes him as a a compelling character to me. And what is particularly relevant about that is that Superman's two biggest nemeses, two biggest antagonists are also the two biggest antagonists in young justice. (laughs) And there are very specific kind of meta reasons for that, that I'll get into, but like, fascinating things happen when you thematically look at like what those characters represent in those two very different con uh, contexts. Yeah. That like says a lot about both Superman and young justice. That is the thesis statement of the Ted talk that I'm going to give. So Superman's got two nemeses, right? There are two people that there are two figures, two pop culture figures that are sort of the 
if you are thinking about Superman, there are two sort of enemies that connect with that character. There is Lex Luthor, which is the 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 one that everyone thinks of, and then there's Darkseid. Those are the two figures. Those are Superman's two big, important nemeses. And in thinking about this, right, because there's been 75, 80, what, 77 years, I think, of Superman comics, I think, something like that. It's a little, little bit more because Batman just passed 80th. Uh, and Superman was a little before Batman, but you're yeah. around that realm. <laughs> Something in that realm so of like many that many years. Superman years that like these two figures becoming that entwined is important. And it reflects a lot about like what the story of Superman is from a like character creation perspective from like a background behind the scenes perspective and also from like as a thematic mythical figure. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Luthor first because he's a character that like I have a lot to say about. And that is um, for, so when we think about Superman and we talk about like the behind the scenes creation of the character of Superman, I think something that a lot that people who talk about Superman often overlook is that Superman is the creation of two lower class, poor working class Jewish kids in 1938 like in it, it Jewish kids in 1938 in the inner city who are working class like yes. they are, those are very important things that put a lot of what Superman is in a very specific context yes it it is very and it 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 tracks like that is that is the power fantasy that Superman represents that is who is creating the power fantasy of Superman that is why in his first appearance the person that Superman beats up is a crooked landlord. <laughs> Like it is that it is a very specific working class power fantasy that it is an ordinary person that like is that that can stand up to people in power as interpreted by a crooked landlord. What is interesting about that is that brings us to Lex Luthor specifically in his current iteration, which I would need to run the numbers on. But I believe the current iteration of Lex Luthor has outlasted the other sort of iterations. Like, I think that he has been head of Lex Corp, suit and tie, hands behind the back, powerful, untouchable businessman for longer than he was the evil scientist or the, the, oh, the kingpin of crime or any of these other iterations. Yeah. But I'd have to run the numbers on it. But like, I think that is the case. And even if it's not the most most years, it is the most lasting in people's imaginations yeah. at this point. Yeah, it's it's the one that you think that like we think of in like when you think about Lex Luthor, like those are important qualities that even if you are reinterpreting that character, like it comes back to yeah. that, which is interesting because it wasn't that way until 86. But like that is the interpretation that people come to and like it is interesting like that in and of itself is a perfect example of antagonistic design because you're taking something that is sort of foundational to this character both on screen and off you're taking superman as the on-screen blue collar farm boy from smallville kansas and the off-screen creation of working class people who are dealing with a lot of very real fears about their own lives and putting and directly going the direct opposite of that is the businessman 80 floors above the city in a pristine suit in a building that is shaped like the letter in his name like that figure yeah. and and that luthor and like that creates this 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 element that is Un inseparable from the character of Superman like that kind of like crystallizes that Superman is this blue collar figure in a way that it's kind of intractable now like you you yeah. kind of can't create a Superman story with the character of Superman and not in some way connect it back to that sort of blue collar origin because it's so intrinsic and the fact that Luthor is the opposite of that itself becomes intrinsic. It's like the thing that it's the debate that I see that happens nowadays is every now and then some executive or higher up is like, there's no way to make Superman relevant these days. And you're like, a a 
blue collar reporter in an urban area whose biggest enemy is an evil billionaire. And you're telling me that that that's not relevant. None of that's relevant right now. (laughs) And and a a working class, a working class immigrant raised by good, honest folks who moved to the city and became a reporter. And like none of those things feel relevant. Really? Yeah. (laughs) I just love when people just break it down like that. And they're like, you've you've missed what Superman is. Yeah, you, you you missed a thing or two along the way. Yeah, it's so many people have feel. I feel like there's a level of, depending on how much you think about Superman, some people have kind of lost sight of how important that is to that character, and he's just mm-hmm. become like real powerful goodest of good guys who's an alien. And I'm like, it's a little more complicated than that. Which is also why. I mean, and and here's a whole other topic that connects back to anyone can wear the mask, but is a separate thing that I was thinking about that is relevant to this exact conversation. There's a book that I hate. And I'm gonna, <laughs> I, I try not to talk about stuff that I don't like, but I'm going to talk about something that I don't like. I hate how Frank Miller writes. I could just leave it at that, but I hate how Frank <laughs> Miller writes Superman in The Dark Knight Returns. It's a very specific character choice that I actively, actively do not like how he writes Superman in The Dark Knight Returns, where Superman, for for those that have not read, it is Batman is an old man. He's considering retiring. He goes kind of rogue and has to be taken down. And they present Superman throughout the whole thing as the only way to describe it is like a Reagan funded war criminal. He's like doing coups and things and like deposing governments and stuff. I don't like this. And the reason that I don't like it is I understand what Frank Miller is doing and presenting Superman as the symbol of order as opposed to Batman as sort of the symbol of chaos. But I don't think it works because it it ignores a very pertinent thing about Superman that like in writing anyone can wear the mask and thinking about it kind of really clicked with me and dawned on me. People in power hate Superman. (laughs) Like, shockingly consistently, people in authoritative establishment positions, like in canon, hate Superman. Yeah. And it's very interesting that Batman is sort of the canonically rogue of the heroes, is the one that, like, is the, everybody looks at it and is like, oh, well, that's Batman. He's a criminal vigilante. He's the knight. He it's is the dark justice. of it all, man. It's the it's so is. Because Batman gets a coffee with Jim Gordon every New Year's <laughs> Eve and every single cop in Metropolis, every named cop in Metropolis, it is a character trait that they hate Superman's guts. Like Maggie Sawyer consistently for the first half of her like existence as a character, I think they eventually like change her perspective. But like a big part of her character is like, we don't need Superman. We can do his job better than he could. Like, why is he doing this? You have characters like Dan Turpin who like, actively are like superman's a threat and it's gonna come out one day and i don't i don't trust him (laughs) you have like scientists like cadmus labs in in young justice is like a perfect example of like people in positions of power do not trust superman (laughs) do not like him and if they want to work with him it's because they want to double cross him yeah and he is a sweet a sweet beautiful boy that will go along with them and then be mortified when he finds out that they cloned him and made it and made superboy (laughs) And I think it's one of those things that I talk a lot when talking about superhero media and talking about like the power fantasies behind superhero Mm -hmm. media, that there's become this idea that's prevalent in a lot of more mainstream, wider conversations about superheroes, that people present the idea of superheroes as it's the power fantasy of of being powerful and doing impossible Mm -hmm. things. When I think really, and I know I've read this somewhere else, but I do not know who said it first or if it's just kind of a gathered quote kind of thing. But it's that superheroes aren't the power fantasy of having power, that the they're the power fantasy of having power and choosing to do good with it. And yeah, how yeah, Superman sure. is the ultimate example of that, of the man who has the most power is the man who chooses to do the most good Mm -hmm. as regularly as possible in the only way he can see fit to do so. And what is what is fascinating about that, uh, going back again to the sort of meta 
history of the care who created Superman and in, in doing so created superheroes. It's very fascinating that like Superman as a figure is someone who chooses to do that good in spite of the fact that uh, that persistently throughout his entire publication history, excluding perhaps a short period in the like 50s when they were leaning hard on the comics code and couldn't make authority figures actively evil. Authority figures consistently have been portrayed as not trusting Superman. Luthor being kind of the biggest example as the sort of infinitely powerful business figure, the person that runs the world, being like, I hate you and I, I want to destroy you. But like I said, you've got people like Cadmus Labs. You've got people like every every story about a scientist that steals Superman's blood to build a blood laser. Stop like, stealing this man's blood. <laughs> Stop it. Just let him have his blood. He needs that. It needs it to live. And we keep taking it to make blood lasers. And frankly, it <laughs> seems inefficient. Every story about like a powerful scientist who's like, I'm going to crack Superman. Something that like occurred to me. I don't know that like the mayor of Metropolis is not a character. <laughs> There's no I, I'm certain that someone I'm certain that someone could point to me and say. Superman, the mayor of Superman is named this when they interacted in these ways. But like for someone that does everything that Superman does, you would think that someone in that position would have would be a presence. And yet, like we don't have the name of a Commissioner Gordon type in Metropolis. Like the Superman stories don't have those sorts of powerful government figure characters because everybody consistently is portrayed as either reluctantly accepting Superman or actively undermining him, which ultimately ultimately does is, is one of the things and I'll get I'll come back to this, but is a thing that connects back to young justice <laughs> and also a thing that connects to anyone can wear the mask where I made a very conscious decision to make one of the like character actions that happens when you flip a card that there is someone in power that wants to see you taken down. I've described it elsewhere as the J. Jonah Jameson mechanic, <laughs> and I feel like that's the right name for it, is that there is someone that's like, you're a menace, and I'm going to destroy you, even if it means I have to create the scorpion. <laughs> so that's Luthor. We've talked about yes. Luthor a fair amount. And, like, it makes a lot of sense that he is sort of the antagonist. But what is interesting is that fairly late in the character's creation, I think, like, the 70s, I mean, Superman's been around for almost 50 years at that point, is when Darkseid shows up and very quickly, partially because Darkseid debuts in like a Superman comic, like he, he first shows up in Jimmy Olsen, but like in a very large way, like Darkseid becomes the second iconic Superman villain. Like super, uh, jo Superman's like rivalry and hatred of Darkseid becomes like a very deep running thing. And in thinking about it, it clicked with me in thinking about this episode that like Darkseid is even more than the probably 15 to 20 other characters that try to have this be true of them. Darkseid is the example of super what could go wrong with Superman. Yeah. Darkseid is the most is the most powerful operatic bombastic example of like what of like the worst case for Superman. Yeah. Darkseid is as powerful as Superman and rules over an entire planet with an iron fist, crushing it and rebuilding it in his image as a burning hellscape literally called Apocalypse. <laughs> so like it makes it makes a lot of sense if you're if you're presenting this character like we had talked, like we just said, like if you're presenting a character that is infinitely powerful, doing only good because it's the right thing to do. Having a character that is. Here's what and here's what is not happening makes showcases the the heroism that that character offers. Right. Like yeah. because we we have Superman, we also have Darkseid as the reference point for like, well, this is what could this is what he could do at any moment. The fact that he chooses not to makes every moment that he lives a triumph because he's not we're not reigning on planet super apocalypse. <laughs> Again, accepting the 50s when he did wear a, a Pope hat and declare that he was the space Pope and declare that people like bow to him. 
The 50s Excluding were a weird moment. time in comics, man. They were a weird the 50s moment. 50s were a weird time in comics. <laughs> And I love them dearly. I've re- I've read a lot. I, I it's a it's a thing that I love more uh, a lot. But yeah, it's the idea that Darkseid like also gets at an essential truth of the character, which is what we were just talking about. That Superman could destroy the world with a thought and chooses not to. And that is an intensely powerful thing. That is an intensely powerful experience. An intensely powerful character trait. And by sh- and by creating a character that is well, what if? And and doing it in a way that's not not evil Superman with his cape and his in, you know, which is not Bizarro or any of the other like non Superman versions, but as a character that is just a lack of conscience and just uses that to destroy yeah. planet after planet. Like it creates it creates this essential truth of Superman that I think is really kind of brilliant. All of this takes us to young justice. Yes. All of this and what is what is interesting and sort of the, the 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 climax of all of this for me is it's interesting that the two biggest ne- the two biggest antagonistic figures or two of them, in, in, uh, not including people like Vandal Savage or the light, but like two of the biggest antagonist figures in Young Justice are, su- are Lex Luthor and Darkseid. Yeah. And it's fascinating because, like I said, they are very. Tied to Superman as concepts. And part of the reason that that is the case is because they are, as we discussed, like they're doing the new gods, right? Like I've, I've, I talked about it with Rich, but like Young Justice is telling almost beat for beat the story, like Jack Kirby's fourth world saga to the right down to the fact that in the first few issues of Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, that Jack Kirby writes he introduces Cadmus Labs, the Manhattan Guardian, and Darkseid in that order. <laughs> and in the first episode of Young Justice, we go to Cadmus Labs and we meet a clone of the Manhattan Guardian. Like, they're really intentionally telling the fourth world story, which in a lot of ways is a Superman story. So it's interesting that, and so it makes sense that those characters, Darkseid and Lex Luthor, would show up in Young Justice. Yeah. But what is super interesting and I think is so cool that the Young Justice writers do is they find a different essential truth for those characters in a way that makes that highlights essential truth about Young Justice. That's and it makes it really amazingly concise antagonistic design by taking established characters that are that like are designed to highlight a truth about one character and going and here's how they do the exact same thing for this entire group of teen heroes. Yeah. Because you look at Lex Luthor and you look at him in Young Justice and he is still the infinitely powerful businessman that we had talked about. But more importantly, he's the ultimate grown up. Yeah. Like in Young Justice, he is so specifically that figure that he is so specifically like a teenager's picture of what an adult is. (laughs) Where he has all of this money and he has these plans that you don't understand. And he's telling you, he's telling you that he knows best, even though in the back of your mind, you're like, do you? Because this feels wrong. And he's like, no, no, I've got your back. I love and like it's this very specific picture of like using Luthor and these these truths that we have about him to create him as this picture of like a teen's view of adulthood as. Yeah shifting and untrustworthy and infinitely powerful in ways that you can't quite uh, express shreds like i don't have a better conclusion for that than it absolutely shreds and it, it brilliantly reflects the fact that these are messy teens like yeah have taking that character that is so specifically tied to a working class immigrant reporter character that is in a lot of ways and i've talked about this uh with rich and elsewhere a very adult character yeah like superman is an adult fantasy in a lot of ways he is someone that does good because he gets a job that helps people and he goes out and does his civic responsibility (laughs) and he does all of these important things and he makes the conscious choice to do good which is a very like mature and grown-up thing taking a character that is designed to antagonize that and then going and here's how he also antagonizes a group of teen heroes and does it in a way that forces them to act like teenagers like every time lex shows up in young justice 
one of the teen characters makes a weird, rash, reckless teen decision of like, well, I'm going to so smash true. something up. Like they don't like it. And it's so consistent where it's, it's, it's Lex is the adult in a world full of teenagers and like is the worst picture of like what that means. And it, it, it creates this, it, it highlights the essential truth that young justice are teenagers trying to navigate a world of adults. Yeah. Which is incredibly cool and like is a wonderful contrast experience. And I know we've we've talked before about how this version of Lex Luthor uh, in Young Justice, all he does is give people exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And how that's it's just so it's the it's this super planned kind of antagonism and this super mm -hmm. planned kind of villainy where he just goes, oh, this is what you want. Here you go. People are like, well, you're evil. And he's like, why? I'm giving you yeah. exactly what you asked for. How does that make me evil? And none of them ever have a good answer other than like, because because you are. I know this to be true. <laughs> and that is like what? What better teenage experience than to have someone give you like what you or what you want or need and have them go, yeah, but I don't trust you because you're an adult. Like, I don't trust you. Even if you're not doing something overtly like harmful right now, I don't trust you because I'm a teenager. Like that is it's it really they they it, it is the perfect like use for this character. And it's it's taking these same established truths and like lightly lightly putting them in a different direction to create an entire other set of essential truths which is yeah just like next level like villain writing and it is like the most exciting thing to me and it's also so good in this context of it is also if you look at all of the episodes that lex Luthor is in where he is doing these things of trying to manipulate mm -hmm. these teenagers the thing he is consistently unable to account for is that they're teenagers? Like he keeps assuming he understands how these kids work and mm -hmm. how he would be able to manipulate them. And then they turn around and are like, no, no you have a yeah. completely flawed understanding of how teenagers work <laughs> kind of thing. Parents he's just like, don't understand. He's just like, Superboy, here's exactly what you want. It's all of the powers of Superman and it will be great. And literally give it five episodes. And su and he's like, assuming he's like, Superboy will come back. He'll get what he wants. I've, I've won. And Superboy's like, I'm just going to tell my friends I have a problem. <laughs> That's my it's, plan. <laughs> I I mean, this is wholly unrelated to my TED talk, <laughs> but I just need to gush Please about do. how utterly excited I was for the episode of Young Justice where they present the bad guys winning and then they flash back to every single member of Young Justice walking into a room and going, Hey, everybody, Lex Luthor wants to manipulate me into working against you. We're like, uh, what should I do about that? And then like another character comes up and he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, my dad is a super <laughs> villain. Did I not make that clear? I should probably spec. And like they all walk in a room and just have like a healthy conversation. It's and it so changes good. <laughs> they, literally like it's one of the it is just I they don't intend it to be comedy. I don't think. But it is. I think I think they have to because it is so laugh out loud funny of watching these characters just be like, let's have this health. Let's just talk. Let's just talk about our problems. And then we and then they just effortlessly save the day. Watching that episode for the first time, it was one of those things where, like, I don't feel like it's comedy, but I get I watching it. I remember having that feeling where you're laughing, but it's not because something's mm -hmm. funny. It's just because you're just like overjoyed at what is happening it's, it's triumphant yeah it's this, it's this perfect feeling of like feeling like the the thing that should happen happens yeah and like it's because it, it really was like so much of the season building up to that or building up to that moment was that back of the mind feeling like watching tv of like if the characters just talked about this like it wouldn't be an issue and then they reveal to you at the last moment yeah, they talked about it immediately and it was at no point an issue. What did you think was happening? And yeah. it's like the it's just it's 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 next level. It was a moment that like I It's <sighs> so good because there is that trope of especially media that is centered around younger characters of mm -hmm. like oh, they're teenagers, they have no concept of how to have a healthy conversation about stuff, which is just not true and is one mm -hmm. of the great things about Young Justice, not even as a superhero show, but as a show about teenagers, yeah. was that it continually respected the fact that 
these their kids, but kids aren't stupid. And yeah, kids they, they, aren't it's... non-functioning when it comes to actually talking about things. So it literally, the show just goes, we have reached the breaking point of there is no reason for Superboy to keep this secret. So he mm-hmm. doesn't. He just and doesn't. Him He's... not and him going, here is the truth and the thing I am struggling with makes other people go, okay, if we're all gonna accept that, how do we feel about this? And telling whatever their thing is, and it just mm-hmm. works. And it has it's that level good. of hilarious, just not even because it's funny or because it's comical, but because you are so not expecting it because th- yeah. there have been expectations about a show like this that Young Justice goes, no, those are, no, don't do that trope. It, it plays against the trope so perfectly and like it makes you think it's going to play the trope and then just effortlessly doesn't. And yeah. like it it may, it ultimately does, it ultimately achieves the really wonderful thing of like acknowledging what's bad about the trope by <laughs> just not doing it. And yeah. being like, yeah, what did you think was going to happen? These characters are just going to talk and bond and and support each other. Like and like it 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 highlights the absurdity of that trope by actively avoiding it. Yeah. And it's Thank it's you for moment. allowing me to just gush about that moment cuz it's great. It's a good moment. It's a real good moment. So then we have Dark Side. Yes. And Dark Side again, it's very much the same deal where they take the same essential truths about this character and highlight them and in, and and present them in a way that transforms the character and informs young justice while also like keeping those truths the same because dark side remains in a lot of ways the worst example of what could happen with superman but when you but in using him against young justice it changes and it expands into this is the worst example of what could happen with superheroes. Yeah. Which in a world and it creates that it, again, it's the perfect contrast to a teen, a team of teenaged heroes who are the the sidekicks and the protégés of established heroes. Yeah. Is to present them with a threat that is very specifically here is the worst case scenario for the people that you look up to. Like here is what the people that you look up to are capable of at any given moment. Yeah. And like having that figure present creates this profound, like in it's, it's again, like it's the same truth. That's the same fact that dark side is the worst case scenario for what Superman could do. But in showing that to a bunch of people that are like the younger iterations of the next generation of these heroes, it really, it creates and it, it drives so much of that drama of like, I don't know if I trust the, the older generation because Like any one of them could be this. This could be true of any character that we are looking up to. Yeah. And those two villains together create such a crux of the drama that you see in Young Justice. And the way that the writers do it is like brilliant. It is just like a brilliant use of like antagonistic design to inform the drama that unfolds with these characters. It is in it, it the way that they do it with these characters that also have these truths that relate to Superman specifically is it, it's chef's kiss. And this whole Ted talk is just me going, Hey, young justice, you did this thing. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I think with that, that entire concept of dark side as the worst thing that could happen with superheroes is also built up to with the fact mm-hmm. that a lot, not every single one of, but most of the core season one team has a specific, villain equivalent that is Mm -hmm. like the dark the dark side of their powers kind of thing yeah and the way that we build up to kind of that dark side reveal and that dark side tie-in thematically is really enhanced by the fact of showing like here's artemis the worst Mm -hmm. thing that could happen with artemis is sportsmaster and cheshire Mm -hmm. here is miss martian the worst thing that can happen with miss martian is simon and queen bee and just kind of mm-hmm. showing these comparisons that are yeah. very clear and very good uh, thematically helps to kind of put that in the viewer's mind so that you can build up to dark side and have mm-hmm. that amazing thematic relevance. You're right. It's it's such a natural endpoint because like we've already seen and it, it plays so nicely because we've already seen Luthor, who is the worst case of what like in a lot of ways of like is the ultimate antagonist to Superman. So then then having Darkseid appear after after we've met all of these other villains, yeah. these other worst case scenarios as here's what 
here's what ha- here's what anybody with this power level could turn into at any moment. And yeah. like you have to deal with that <laughs> is it's it's next level good. It's next level good. That's so good. Young Justice is good. Hot it's take. good. It turns out it's good. It turns <laughs> out it's good. Who would have guessed, listening to Whelm, that our take on this would be Young Justice is good at things. <laughs> Who would have guessed? But yes. So any any more closing thoughts on uh Superman and his nemeses before before we move on? No, I think we got I think I thank you. The, uh, this, this has been my TED talk. Thank you for listening, and I I appreciate the opportunity to share it. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing it. Thank you for coming and sharing your TED Talk with us. We all very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower, Jeff. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime and find anyone can wear the mask? Uh, So you can find uh, all of my work, my podcasts, games, all of the stuff that I do at jeffstormer.com. Uh, you can find anyone can wear the mask. Uh, it's dropping on December 16th at uh, jeffstormer.itch.io slash mask. Um, you can find that there. That'll be available. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Party of One Pod. Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, uh, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And if that isn't enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating or review, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those, and you'd just be helping us out, saving us some time. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews once those become a thing again, actual play podcasts, fan meetups once those become a thing again, discussion sessions, and so much more. We try to do lots of cool things and you can help us with Patreon. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.